I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I wanted to uh, talk about being open-minded, not knowing, curious, interested in our relationships to continue the long series of talks or our focus over uh, many weeks on how to live together, really, whether it's just with one person, how do we be together? How do we work together? How do we have a country together? How do we have a world together? a family, an organization, a community, a friendship group. How do we do it, right? So that's what we've been exploring. And last week, I was talking about the inherent necessity of placing bets in life because we can't perfectly control or predict the future. And that was in the context of last week's talk and the week before it, in which I explored trust, mistrust, and deep trust in relationships. And in terms of uh, the things that we can have deep trust in, that really do seem quite reliable in a messy, complicated world, uh, really Im important. What are the things we can really count on? And I was saying that one of them is love. Huh? You can count on love. Um, you can count on the love flowing through you. And if you have a choice, bet on love. Then I used a goofy example from decision theory in, in which I'll repeat the example, which I don't think I was as clear about as I should be. In this life, we're faced with choices. And not making a choice is itself a choice. We cannot avoid choices. So if we're going to make good choices, we have to place a bet. And I'll give you an example. Our son, I can admit it, uh, he played poker online 10, 15 years ago, in part to put himself through college because he was good at it. And he would be playing four tables at the same time, tracking the odds of what would happen if he placed one kind of bet or another. And he would routinely be in a situation in which, for example, if he placed a certain bet, there were two chances in three that he would win the pot. Two chances in three is pretty good. Very often, he was betting on margins that were closer to 45, 55-45 uh, or even 51-49, right? Two out of three, that's pretty good. But that meant that one in three times, when he placed that bet, he would lose his money. Did that mean he made a bad decision to place that bet with a two out of three chance of winning? No. It was the right decision based on the information he had at the time. And it would always be the right decision. So then I used a more extreme example uh, in which if you're facing two doors, the left or my left, the right-hand door, and you know that behind one of those doors is everything you want. Pot, piles of gold, enlightenment, a wonderful life partner, whatever, behind one door. And behind the other door, the right-hand door, let's, or the other door, is a, a, a tiger who will eat you, okay? So you have the left-hand door, um, the right-hand door. And Behind one is everything you want, and behind the other is a tiger who will eat you, and you don't know what's behind which door. But then the people tell you there's a 51% chance that the gold and everything else you want is behind the left-hand door. There's just a 49% chance that there will be a tiger behind the left-hand door. Which door should you open every single time you have a chance. The left-hand door. Even though 49 times out of 100, a tiger will jump out and eat you. 
it was still the right choice because you had a little better chance and you have to pick a door. You have to open a door. So the odds are with you if you choose the left-hand door that has a 51% chance rather than a 49% chance of being good for you. Now, I hope that that um, statistical you know, explanation was not too abstract or weird, but to me, it makes the point that's actually very freeing, which is that in this life, all we can do is place bets. All we can do is make our offering in this life. We can do the best we can, but we cannot perfectly predict or control the results. And if we are gonna place bets in this life, what do you wanna bet on? Bet on your good intentions, bet on love, bet on um, the strengths you have to keep solving problems and figure things out. Bet on yourself as you go through this life. Some of my biggest mistakes in this life involved not really believing in myself in my 20s and not betting on myself in ways that I could have and should have back then. So this idea of placing bets, uh, in a sense, makes us responsible for placing good bets, making good choices, but it relieves us of a lot of responsibility for the results because the results of our choices are largely out of our hands because they will be affected by so many things. In our relationships, we often have expectations about other people or we think we know what they want or will say, or how they will react. We think we know these things, which reminds me of the teaching from the great Zen master, Suzuki Roshi, bless his memory, in which he said famously, in the beginner's mind are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are only a few. When we bring that quality of beginner's mind into our relationships, we see new possibilities. We don't get so caught in our habits of reaction. We become less hijacked by our assumptions and the beliefs that we suck other people into. And what enables us to get those benefits with other people is the, the feeling, the stance of not knowing. Or in the title of a beautiful book um, from Suzuki Roshi, a collection of his teachings, not always so, not always so. So I invite you to, to reflect on one or more uh, relationships, and in particular, focus on something that's challenging or a conflict, you know, tense. Maybe you get reactivated. Maybe you get, like I can get, a little pushy about it. Reflect on that, or maybe reflect on a relationship in general that has troubled you. Maybe it's what you think about when you go to sleep. You, you have an adult child that worries you or a friend or relative who will not talk to you. Or maybe you feel frustrated in a relationship because you'd like to ask for something and you feel afraid to. Whatever it might be, ground this this exploration tonight in a particular relationship and then ask yourself, how might it help if I brought more of an attitude of not so sure <laughs> or don't know, maybe so, don't know. What would happen 
if you were more curious rather than sure about what the other person is thinking or valuing, what might happen? What might happen? So to make this a little more concrete, let's start with the answer to a question I got from the great teacher, uh, Joseph Goldstein. And I've had the idea that it would be very interesting if we could get a critical mass of people worldwide, let's say a billion people, to do something for five minutes a day that could change the course of history. What might that be? If a billion people did something for five minutes a day, what could they do that could change the course of human history? It's a good question, which has no right answer. There are, but it's the right question, <laughs> or it's a right question. So I asked Joseph, as I've asked many people this question, if you could get a billion people to do one thing a day, what would that one thing be that could be really, really helpful? What would you suggest, Joseph? And he said, without pausing, and I was expecting some kind of cosmic teaching of the Dharma, you know, with fireworks and cosmic realms, and I have no idea, just out, something amazing, something like that. No, he said, I would have people spend five minutes a day listening to another person with no judgments or expectations. Wow. So you can feel the power of that. So right there, you might ask yourself, what could happen in an important relationship, including a relationship that may have some trouble in it? What could happen if I just listened without any judgments or expectations for five minutes in a row? What might that offer the other person? What might relief or reassurance that bring to me with that other person? You know, when you engage in what in Australia and, and perhaps other places could be called deep listening, deep listening, in a way, it's a very safe position in which to be. It's relatively inoffensive. We're not getting into an argument. It brings in a lot of useful information. It's a, it's a good place to be. I, I learned as a very shy, I was a shy teenager, and particularly around um, girls, which is in terms of the gender category, I guess, how I thought of, how I thought of them, I, I didn't know what to do. And then I, I learned that one of the best things I could do was to listen. Because very often, as you may have noticed, young men tend to talk a lot about themselves, especially, not always, but many do. And it was a relief, I suspect, for my classmates um, who were young women uh, to, uh, to actually be listened to for a change. And for me, it was very safe and wonderful and Suddenly, I felt much more comfortable in relationships. So listening, listening, simply listening. Of course, in a friendship or a intimate relationship, maybe with a partner, sometimes there's a place for doing this in a structured way. I know couples who will do this. Once a week, they'll, they'll have an occasion where they take turns and they just listen to each other talking from their heart maybe about something they want in the relationship, maybe uh, about something they're just experiencing these days that is wonderful and beautiful, or maybe something they're experiencing that's more of a challenge. Uh, but they just listen and they take turns. And then they may comment, perhaps. But during, while they're listening, they're not commenting. So you might think about that. You might think about that uh, as, an, as an expression of don't know mind. It's sometimes called beginner's mind, child mind, fresh mind, in the present. A second thing you might consider in a challenging relationship 
is the principle of investigation. Investigation, or which is a fancy word, suddenly it sounds like Sherlock Holmes. I mean it <laughs> in a gentle, respectful, humble, open inquiry kind of way, rested in not being so sure, not knowing, in which we're curious about another person. In the seven factors of awakening, of enlightenment, in the Buddhist tradition, investigation is one of them. We're, we're looking, we're curious, we want to understand. I think of, I believe, one of the seven habits of highly effective people from Stephen Covey, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Start with understanding. And so with another person, sometimes we just investigate inside our mind because maybe it's not appropriate to ask them questions or we can't because of our circumstances, at least at the time. But inside our mind, we can wonder what might be motivating that in them? Why do they keep doing that? What might they start be starting to feel based on the fact that in our last three or four interactions, I found something that they could improve and mentioned it to them? Hmm. <laughs> what might be gradually building up in them because of that history? So we can investigate inside our own minds and in thoughtful ways. Um, we can also investigate uh, directly with another person, hopefully respectfully, hopefully gently and skillfully, we can try to find out um, what are the feelings that go along with those thoughts and words. Not trying to play therapist or be a prosecutor, pinning them down, just open, curious, interested, investigating. What might be the softer feelings of hurt or worry underneath a surface of anger? We could ask another person, maybe. We might ask them, wow, I'm sorry, something happened here. What is it that you wish had happened? Or the next time we're in this kind of situation, what do you hope we do that will be different next time? These are good questions of inquiry, empathic inquiry, even just sharing guesses. Huh, I'm guessing you might be sort of frustrated, or maybe that's the wrong word, feeling pressured, stressed, I don't know. But I'm kind of guessing, what are you feeling? Or is that even close? How would you say it? Some people do not like others trying to understand them. <laughs> For them, it might feel invasive or the prelude to some kind of control based on their history. I can relate to that, given my childhood. Uh, and so maybe we don't go public with our inquiry. We just stay inside our own minds. Other people, I experience a lot of people they might look at you twice to double check that you're sincere and that this is not some gimmick or a covert effort to sell them something or persuade them to something, that you are genuinely interested and that you genuinely don't know and you'd like to find out. Lots of people, in my experience, are quite appreciative of others who approach them in that way. So we have um, a sense of not knowing, we have deep listening, we have investigation that's more active. You may recognize investigation as the I in the RAIN acronym, R-A-I-N, from Michelle McDonald, uh, developed further by Tara Brock, in which the N is nurture, the I is investigate, the A is allow or accept, and the R is recognize. So investigating, it's a really, really, really important thing. 
And then there's a third thing you might think about with other people. Um, alongside deep listening and investigating, you might think about uh, expectations or assumptions and holding them very, very lightly. The brain, to help us survive, is continually generating predictions about the future. For example, I'm about to reach for a water bottle, and as I reach for it, my brain will make a prediction about how heavy it is and therefore how much muscle power I need to bring to bear so that I can successfully grasp it and bring it toward myself. You may have had the experience in which you're looking at something and you reach for it and there's an assumption that, for example, it's an empty cup, uh, but it's full and you can't really lift it or you think it's a full cup so you bring a certain amount of force to it, but it's only half full, so the water starts sloshing around. You know, uh, It's a natural ongoing process, but we can hold it lightly. It's natural to form assumptions or beliefs about others. It's natural to form expectations, but we can hold them lightly. We don't have to become identified with those assumptions and expectations, those beliefs. And with other people, you might deliberately see what happens when you enter into a conversation with them without expecting anything? It's a really powerful practice. It's hard to sustain it because our brain is generating expectations, right? Um, but to just be there without any predicting of a future and no attempt to become a future, just resting entirely in the present without any beliefs or expectations about the future. That can be really interesting with other people, in part because then there's no effort to influence them. You're not trying to control them or influence them. You're not trying to nudge them in any direction. Imagine what it's like or recall what it's like to be with someone who has no expectations of you. They're not trying to slot you into any kind of script. You don't have to meet any standards for them. They have no expectations for you. It's not that they think you're such a schlub that they have no expectations. Uh, they just don't know. Expectations have no place to land in their mind. It's so empty. Expectations kind of just fall right through. In that way, we can give other people that benefit when we don't have expectations for them, or at least we are not governed by our expectations for them. And this then takes me to my last example of um, not knowing in relationships that you might think about in your own relationships. So we have deep listening, right? Investigating, releasing expectations, and fourth, staying out of scripts. The brain tends to form knowledge of relationships in script-like ways. Certain situations, you have a role, they have a role in those situations. You have your lines, they have their, their lines, and there's kind of an expectation of a plot, a progression. Uh, the young child calls out, ah, hungry. <laughs> a translation is hungry. And then there's an expect, let's say there's a script in which a caregiver hears the call of the child and let's say starts making noises like getting some food together and then brings it to the child the child is fed very good that's like a little script right well as necessary and normal as scripts are in our relationships we can become trapped in them or other people can trap us in their script for us so this last one is a two-way street 
think about in an important relationship that's got some trouble in it, maybe, or it's unsatisfying. It's okay, but it feels stuck in some kind of a box. You might ask yourself, are there some scripts that you're stuck in or they're stuck in where they are trying to stick you in that would be good to break out of? Maybe they are trying to cast you in the role of being a bossy authority figure when you're just a colleague who is smart and has good ideas and wants to offer them. But you're not a bossy authority figure. You're not presuming that script, which is their transference of a script from their own history, maybe. Or maybe you are in a relationship with someone who keeps trying to cast you in the role of romantic partner. And you want to stay in the script of being just friends, for example. Or maybe you have people who see you in a very familiar way but over the last six months, you've been going through a lot of growth. You've been healing. You've been growing. You've been awakening. And it's like you're wearing a coat that's two sizes too small in that relationship. And you need more room to breathe, to be yourself, to get looser, to take chances on this new way of being. The other way, maybe with some key people in your life, you have you are forcing them into a small place by the conventionality of the topics you bring up, the questions you ask, while in fact, there would be more life, more energy, more mystery, more juice, more creativity if you gave them more room to breathe and open into new ways of being. Okay, so I invite you to consider these four different ways of applied not knowing in your relationships. Applied not knowing does not mean being dumb or oblivious to what you see. You can not know while also seeing clearly, and you can go through rhythms in which there's an emphasis on openness and not knowing, freshness, discovery with other people, and followed maybe by a rhythm of consolidating what you've learned through not knowing and forming a discerning clarity or updating your clarity about another person, and then going back into a rhythm of openness, inquiry, and not knowing. We can do this rhythm over the course of a single minute, a couple of times even in, a, in an interaction. And we can do this rhythm of not knowing, clarifying, not knowing, clarifying over weeks and months and even years in a, in a longer term relationship. Okay. Well, I'm seeing by the way at 7 p.m. touches my heart from Barbara. On my first date with my husband, he asked, what are your hopes and dreams? And then he listened. Keeper, she says, with an exclamation point. Okay, great. Okay, great. Well, any questions toward the bottom? Can I give an example of the rhythm? Great. So I'm thinking right now of, um, let's say, my wife who I've been married to for 40 years. It's easy to form a lot of assumptions over a long period of time. And <clears throat> I, I will just say that uh, often I'll have the experience in which, let's say in the morning when we kind of gather in the kitchen, like couples often do, get our coffee, kind of wake up, talk about what we're doing that day. Maybe there's something. And I can find myself listening to her in a very routine way. 
as, as I get organized myself and I'm slotting what she's saying into familiar boxes. And okay, okay, good, got it, yeah, da da. So that would be an example of what I'm calling the clarifying or, you know, conventional knowing. And then often I'm happy to report, I'll kind of catch myself and I'll just look at her in a fresh way. And suddenly I'll see the face of this, I'll see this young woman in the face of someone who's 68. I'll, I'll see her bright, ageless eyes. I'll see the twinkle. I'll see the spirit I love. And I'll, I'll feel, don't know. Like There's a sense of, oh, don't know. And in that don't know is excitement, isn't there? When we don't know, that, then we're in child mind. Why do you think children are happy a lot? Because they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> when you have kids, you, little ones especially, you start to realize what life is like, you know, a foot or two off the floor, and it's really different. Don't know. So that would be an example of a kind of rhythm. Or maybe I'm talking with someone in a business setting or an organizational setting I'm involved in right now, and we're rolling along, and it seems like we're tuning into each other. It's very good, and we're aligned. But then suddenly there's some sort of roadblock or a misunderstanding. And I don't understand why there's a misunderstanding. You know, my righteous mind then comes up and says, what's so hard to understand here? Okay, righteous mind, thank you for sharing. We got it, thank you, fine. And then I might move out of that kind of conventional form of knowing that's efficient when it's all going well into stepping back, big picture, don't know, mind. What's happening here? What did I miss or what's going on? What, to, what can I become more aware of? That would be an example of that rhythm. Okay. So I'm seeing one person who has raised their hand, Zoom user. And uh, so I'm happy to take questions from people. I always ask that you be succinct and clear with a question that is related to what I've been talking about. So Zoom user, I'm asking you to unmute. And then Najeli, uh, great, we'll be able to get to you. So Zoom user, I've asked you to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Are you able to do that? Tell you what, maybe you accidentally put your hand up and I'll go to you, Najeli. I'll ask you to unmute. Naj Najeli, great. Okay, just thank you. Thank you, Rick. Beautiful talk. Just a visual. Um, maybe you can help me with this. Sure. The not knowing is like a bubble, like a territory. And inside of this territory, we can live. Uh, inside of this territory, we look one side is the not knowing with awe, with, with uh, curiosity. And the other side is the not knowing of fear. Uh -huh. of, uh, yes, excellent. So, and and we have a spring that turns turns us into the fear, into the anxious mind. Yes. Uh, how do we make the, the turn inside the territory? Ah, very good. Yes, if we are um, walking at in darkness at night, and we do not know if the next step will fall off the cliff right, or fall through the ice, we don't know, then of course that would tend to make us more anxious. That, that makes sense. And I find that one way to really help with anxiety is to establish for yourself what is true, what is real. There, there, there's a place for knowing, right? There really is a place for knowing. And sometimes in a relationship in which we feel like we are on shaky ground, it can help to increase our useful knowing by starting with not knowing and not being so sure. Okay, yeah, great. So, so I would take with this that a, a sense of refuge, of security, is the, the space from where you can make the turn to this uh, wonder, wondrous uh, 
not knowing with with curiosity yeah yeah i think that's right and you know i we are make i am i am making this very kind of dualistic you know not knowing knowing in the moment it's more a question often of degree like yeah. we know we're in a room we know we're breathing we know the name of the person we're talking with right yeah. but um we can also hold that kind of ordinary mind in a framework of openness even mystery what will the future be we have yeah, we, that's, we that's don't the know. hard part <laughs> yeah we don't know and yeah. uh exactly what it will be and in all that i think there's a feeling you know this can all sound sort of intellectual there's a feeling of not knowing of the what the feeling of openness right um the feeling of curiosity even the feeling of delight there's a kind of delight when you don't know and honestly i i right here i'm thinking of the famous american um television person mr rogers frank rogers who mm -hmm. did a tv show with children and and one of the things you could see when he would meet a child is that he did not make any assumptions about them he did not know he was curious right he was curious and uh you could feel that there was a you know a beginner's mind in mr rogers in which there were many possibilities and that was a delight right that was a delight don't know thank you beautiful invitation thank yeah, you yeah great great stuff well any other questions let's see here how do you stop talking and listen i love that question question rachel at 23 minutes after the hour right how can you um uh, stop listening and stop talking that's a great question well a couple things it helps to notice when you are talking a lot especially if you have a position of privilege in society it's very helpful to actually ask yourself if you are using more than your share of the time really helpful second i think a lot of this has to do with sincerity of purpose in other words um if if you're sincere in in your interest and your your meta for the other person your benevolence your good wishes even if you disagree with them even if they are your adversary and you need to protect yourself if you are sincere in your interest toward the other person you will naturally listen you will you will um naturally do that so i think that also it helps to find what is interesting in what you are hearing and this is under our influence a lot uh one of the things i've have helped myself learn how to do is to be interested and to find what is interesting in the other person and that is a wonderful gift right for yourself to learn how to find what is interesting uh my father uh, grew up on a ranch in north dakota and he became a um zoologist and as we all noticed about him he's no longer alive uh he was endlessly curious he could look at dry grass growing out of the side of a road cut where we parked to look at the view for a moment 
while driving in California, let's say, he and I, and he would look at that road cut, dry grass, and he would wonder why the grass drew, grew here and not here or up higher because he was kind of a scientist and he was a scientist actually. And he would wonder, he was interested, right? In the craziest things. I went with him to uh, Buenos Aires one time and we were walking down a street. He said, Rick, look at these curbs. They're different from the curbs we have, the curbs on the sidewalk. <laughs> I wasn't noticing the curbs. I was like, wow, we're in Buenos Aires on the way to a dinner, right? But he was like, look at the curbs. They're, they're interesting, right? He was interested. So uh, that cultivation of the, of the capacity to be interested in other people, I think is a really, really good thing. And to, and to move past the surface in what they're saying or the conventional cliches and what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just think how much it's a blessing to you to be interested in them and how much it's a blessing for them to feel your interest in them. Okay. So Larry Best, we will finish with you. I'm asking you to unmute. Great. Good. Excellent. Oh, I think you have to unmute yourself again. Great. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you. For, um, yeah, I I so love what you said about, you know, not focusing on results and just kind of being open and focusing on your good intentions. And I think what I struggle with is so much of the world and the culture and professional culture is always focused on results and our productivity and our livelihood is dependent on that. So how can we keep that open heart and accepting that we don't have control when the predominant culture and our survival um, seems to, you know, kind of forces us to focus or requires us yeah. to focus on results? Yeah, that's so good. Um, I have a business background before I became a soft-hearted, soft-headed therapist, so I can understand. And I'm in situations where I we have a small business ourselves and we need to have certain results occur. We have key indicators. We track things weekly. I mean, there's a place for that. You're driving down the highway, right, Larry? You, you want to make sure that you're in your lane and you know, you're know you not running any red lights. I mean, it's, it's okay to be aware of results. Um, I guess for me where this um, is a practice is around holding the results lightly and emphasizing the causes that we are continually generating and focusing on that produce those effects. So we're, we're paying attention, including in business and in life, to the, to the results, the effects of the forces, the factors that we are mobilizing. There's a place for that. But, uh, and, and in some situations, to be sure, we really focus on the result. Like maybe you're trying to cut something really carefully or in a business environment, your margins are really thin. And you've got to be very, very careful. Now the James Webb telescope now floating in space, I got to visit part of it at NASA when I gave a talk there some years ago and to watch that they were producing results with tolerances like a hundredth of a millimeter or a hundred thousandth of a millimeter. So tiny what they were dealing with. There's a place for that. But a lot, I think it's really helpful to step back and to ask ourselves, you know, am I well-intended? Am I learning? Am I listening? Am I sincere? Am I opening myself, including to people who are not like me? Things like that, that are really at the fundamentals. I guess that's what I'm talking about. You know, we can, we can focus on, we, we can emphasize the fundamentals, including in our relationships, right? So in effect, we can know that we really are engaging the fundamentals of being gentle, kind, sincere, 
for patient, we are forgiving, while also taking care of ourselves. We can focus on those fundamentals in our relationships and just know that you cannot make them love you. You cannot make them listen. You cannot make them stop taking drugs. You cannot make them eat the right food, right? Uh, it's hard to get people to do the dishes the right way. <laughs> and there's something about that that I find really helpful. And um, I think about myself as I finish here, how much of the time in my own history, including recently, I'm embarrassed to say a little bit, uh, I have gotten fixated on making certain things happen inside the mind of the other person. Like I'm going to insert, you know, happiness inside their mind or sobriety or self-restraint. And it just feels like too much pressure in other people, for other people. And uh, it's much better to feel like we're making an offering almost at the edges of the other person rather than trying to force it into them. And then recognize they will either pick it up or they won't. And we can, we wish they pick it up, but we can still be at peace deep down if they don't. So let's just take half a minute and sit in the feeling of not so sure. Maybe so. Could be. What might be true? Okay.